Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the eighth seminar on Translation 2021. My name is Yemi Mawahudi, and I'm going to be moderator for today's conference. First of all, I would like to thank to Mr. Harris, the, the speakers, and the participants for joining this conference. Before we start the presentation, I would like to inform you that there will be two presenters for today's conference. Each session divided into two sessions, which are 20 minutes for presentation, followed by 10 minutes for Q&A or question and answer. In question and answer session, judges will deliver the question first, then followed by question for other participants. You may use the rest hands feature in your Zoom, or you can deliver your question through the chat box. The, present, the presenter will answer the question right away. Well, without any further ado, I will welcome our first speaker, Ms. Aurelia Nunkin Wikan Diani from Universitas Sanata Derna. Her personal background is she is a passionate undergraduate student majoring in English literature and language who has learned heaps of skills through on and off campus activities that she participates in. She has interest in writing, language, culture, and things related to collaborative and creative thinking. Currently, she has kept herself busy by completing her thesis and being a public relation intern at Children's Educational Institution in Jogja. Okay, her presentation entitled The Subtitling Strategies of Cultural Terms in Kisa Tanah Jawa Merapi. Ms. Aurelia, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Yamima. Let me share the screen then. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, okay. I'll start the presentation. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for the time given to me. Okay, let me introduce myself first. So my name is Aurelia Nukiwikandiani, as introduced by Yemima earlier. Uh, I'm from the English Letters Department, Sanata Derma. Uh, today, I'd like to present my paper entitled The Subtitling Strategies of Culture-Related Terms in Kisah Tanah Jawa Merapi. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so the rise of uh, worldwide streaming platforms is growing the demand in translation industry because it's making it easier for like the viewers to comprehend or to grasp audiovisual works. So audiovisual work is like a TV series or like films or documentaries. So this translation branch that uses uh, this kind of audio audiovisual works is called the audiovisual translation or abbreviated as the AVT. So it is translated the it translates the language or like the culture of one language into another to the closest equivalence word word in the TL culture. Therefore, as you know, that it plays a significant role in reaching a wider audience. Here, uh, William William and also Chasterman divided AVT into two main categories, which is revoicing and also SAR or subtitling. In this case, uh, one of the streaming platforms in Indonesia that uses AVT is Eflix. So it uses subtitles the most because subtitling is basically like the process of superimposing written text onto the screen. So it is mostly used by uh, the worldwide streaming platforms for translating the audiovisual material. Okay. So Kisah Tanah Jawa Merapi, or the tale of Java land Merapi, is, this, uh, is the object of this paper because it shows like how diverse Indonesian culture and also languages are. So it has six episodes and also has built-in subtitles provided by Eflix, as you guys can see it here on the screen. So this uh, horror series portrays uh, the urban legend of supernatural events commonly believed to be occurred around Merapi. Uh, one of we, uh, one of these is like uh, related to mysteriously missing uh, hikers. So here, KTG 
KDG's dialect is actually spoken in two languages, which is Indonesian and also Japanese. That's why for the primary data uh, in the ST, I use Japanese and also Indonesian dialogue. And for the TT, I use the English subtitle. Okay, next. Uh, in subtitling, there are so many things to be considered, mainly when we are translating the uh, cultural terms because it embodies the society's perspective, identity, beliefs, and also values. So in translating cultural expressions, extra caution is needed to reproduce its essence into the closest natural equivalent in the TL. All right. Uh, in this study, uh, I used 10 subtitling strategies that is proposed by Gottlieb. And Gottlieb also proposed uh, four channels to be considered in making the AVD. So uh, we are going to take a look at this channels too, in case it also affects uh, the quality or like the making of the subtitle. Okay, uh, oh yeah. Furthermore, the study also uses uh, classification guidelines of cultural terms that is proposed by Zer Betash and Firoz Kohi, and then also Tomalin and Samboski, and the last one is by Newmark. Okay, so all these theories would be discussed further in the findings and also discussion session. Okay. For the methodology, uh, I use qualitative and also library research method to help me better understand the phenomenon here in KTG. So the data in KTG is collected through a manual trans transcribing process and then developed using credible sources to find like, for example, theories and also related studies and so on. Then the data is being categorized into uh, the exact uh, strategies or like cultural terms, and then uh, it is concluded. Okay, uh, here are some of the credible sources that I use in the data. And then um, I will explain about the findings and discussion. So, uh, so of all the 65 cultural terms that is found in KVG, it reveals that actually there is 13 classifications of cultural terms and also five groups of subtitling strategies. Okay, now I will explain it one by one from the uh, cultural terms first. So here is uh, the data overview. As we all can see that there are 65 terms here. And next, I will explain it briefly one by one, okay? So the first one is local institutions. It's like the long time big organizations which have, have important role in the society. For example, here in the ST is Barameru Merapi or Alap Alap Merbabu. And then the second one is religious terms. It relates to a particular religion. For example, here, Assalamualaikum. And then the third one is ecology. It's the geographical or environmental phenomena. For example, here, Damen Garing. And then uh, the fourth one is food and drink. It is the solid or liquid substance consumed by human being. For example, here, Aceh Gayo. So Aceh Gayo is actually uh, the variation of a coffee. And then the fifth one, there is belief, belief terms. Belief, belief terms is actually religious conviction or tenets about mythological or supernatural aspects. Uh, exa for example, here Kuntilanak and also Toyol. And then the sixth one is custom. Custom is like traditional habit of group of people that is passed down through generation to generation. For example, here Gawe. And then the seventh one is art terms. It is the branches of creativity. Uh, for example, here performing, uh, it is tanggapan in the ST. And then the eighth one is measuring system term. It is the cultural unit to determine size, weight, and so on. For example, here ato. And then the ninth, the ninth one is habit. Habit is like the behavioral action. For example, here lembur. And then the tenth one is literature. It is the written works of particular subject. For example, here, Buku Quantum Doctor. And the anthroponyms is people's name or like nickname that is related to a uh, regional background that also acquire identi identification of status. For example, here, Doro. And the twelfth one, a date. Date is like time or duration of an event. For example, here, Selasa Kliwon. And then the last one is gesture. Gesture is like movement of a body part. For example, here, celinga celingo. <laughs> okay. So now we've come to the subtitling strategies of Kisah Tanah Jawa Merapi. 
Okay, so Gottlieb actually suggests 10 strategies. But here in KDG, there are 65 data that fall over five categories as I show you guys here on the screen. Here is the data distribution. But as we all can see, uh, the data actually, if you count it, it actually exceeds the primary data because I said there are like 65, but if you count it here, it is more than 65. It is because that several terms actually go through more than one strategy. Okay, so let me discuss the uh, strategy one by one. Okay, the first one is imitation. So it adapts the foreign expression from the SL. For example, here the term Basarnas. So Basarnas is the abbreviation of the Badan Search and Rescue Nasional. So it has SAR in its name, right? SAR, Search and Rescue. Just like in the DL culture, there is a term SAR, Search and Rescue. So as I said before that in AVD, we also have to pay attention to the four channel proposed by Gottlieb, as I mentioned earlier. So in this datum, in this datum number three, the uh, four channel that is uh, being considered here is the NVC or nonverbal visual channel. So it uh, it actually deals with the screen's picture. So as I see, show you guys here, the screenshot of the uh, one of the scene in Kisah Tanah Jawa Merapi. So it shows the activity of the SAR team. And besides in the picture, the news's headline in the screen consists of uh, the term SAR. Right, because so that's why uh, the term SAR is left as it is because the target audience can still understand the context of the dialogue without uh, the subtitler paraphrasing it into SAR or like reduce the word into SAR. Okay, the next one is transfer, so it translates the SL into TL wholly, like for example, here in the term, the first example is kembang kantil. So kembang is being transferred into flower, like literally, and then the word kantil is being imitated because they do not share the same equivalent word. So in this datum number 28, the word uh, kembang can still be translated accurately or like literally into the TL culture because they share the same similarity of the meaning. Moreover here, uh, the screen in the top right, in the top right, as you guys can see, the uh, it the screen also shows the visual of the flower, so the audience can still understand the type of the flower that is being discussed without uh, the subtitler, you know, uh, giving additional information about what kind of uh, kembang kantil that is being discussed. Okay, uh, okay. However, in the other datum number thirty one, for example, here the term ketempelan is being translated wholly or like literally into the term attached. Well, it is semantically correct, but pragmatically it is not because the term ketempelan here means uh, the supernatural experience where an invisible creature attaches itself to waste the energy of the body's owner, right? So it has become less equivalent due to like cultural limitations. However, we could also understand the subtitles word choice because the TL doesn't share the same culture with the SL. So uh, the word attached is kind of like understandable for the uh, target audience to comprehend the discussion because as you guys can see it here on the screen that I read uh, around it here, uh, the wound is kind of like attached to the character's uh, hand, right? So it's kind of like, kind of like makes sense. <laughs> so as we have to remember that in ATC, screen duration also matters in this uh, seen the uh, you know the visual kind of like moving so fast. So I guess that's why uh, the subtitler kind of like only translated into attached. Okay, next one is expansion. So it adds supplementary information to the DL. So the first example here um, is the anthroponym terms juru kunci that is translated into the spiritual guardian. So in Indonesia, especially in Java, there are still many people who hold fast to the culture, especially related to like uh, spiritual matters, right? That's why there is a term called juru kunci. That is the, it means the guardian or like the custodians of graveyards and also sacred places in Java. 
So because uh, Mount, uh, Mount Merapi, sorry, is considered the sacred place in Jogja. And also in this series, it is talking about uh, the mystical things that is happening around Merapi. So the subtitler adds the term spiritual to make it more acceptable to the target audience because it's not just merely like an ordinary guardians or like ordinary custodians, but it is like the soup, spiritual guardians, right? Okay, the second example is the same as the other uh, one, uh, is this as the first example. Even though the ST, ST okay, only mentioned the term Lawu, but it is uh, actually the name of a mountain that is located in the border between East Java and also Central Java. So because uh, the target audience might not really understand what Lawu means in ST, so the subtitler kind of like uh, adding the sub uh, adding supplementary information mount to make the target audience uh, understand on that Lawu is actually a mountain like that. Okay, the port uh, sub uh, strategy is actually paraphrase. So it uh, it rearrange the TT. For example, here the first example is Barameru Merapi and also Alap Alap Merbabu that is translated into climbing club. It is because that both uh, three of them are uh, sharing the same kind of like similar, similar meaning to the DL culture because they are both like mountain related organizations. The same also goes in the second uh, example. It is the religious terms called Astaghfirullah that is translated into oh my god. So as you guys can see that it actually literally translates into I seek forgiveness in Allah. But here the term Astaghfirullah can also express a uh, disapproval or like surprised or shocked. That's why the expression oh my god is kind of like the best way possible for the target audience to still understand the expression in the SL. Okay. Oh this is the last uh, strategy it is the it reduces the essential parts in the SL expressions. For example, here the first expression is jadah tempe. So jadah tempe is actually the traditional food from Kaliurang Yogyakarta, which consists of jadah and also tempe. That's why the term jadah is uh, considered as like the essential part of the food name, right? But it is eliminated because the TL culture does not really share the same equivalent word and doesn't really have this, uh, the equivalent word for it. And then the term tempe is still maintained by the subtitler, but changing it into the English one as tempe because it is more kind of like widely known in the TL culture. And the same also goes in the term kembang setaman that is translated into flower by omitting the word setaman. So the term, as the term is being spoken, uh, the screen in KTG also uh, shows like uh, focuses on the flower that is being discussed. So maybe uh, the subtitler chose to eliminate the word setaman because uh, the uh, because of the uh, screen duration too. So be because the uh, visual is moving so fast, so then maybe it's better to just put the word flower into it. Okay, now we've come to the conclusions. So here, the results from Kisah Tanah Jawa Merapi, there are uh, 65 data that spread over sub, uh, five subtitling strategies and also 13 cultural terms classifications. And also as Indonesia is the country that is rich in culture and also traditions. And as this series also talks about uh, supernatural things, it is no surprise that the cultural terms, ecology, and also beliefs dominating the data. Moreover, the most uh, productive or like do, the one that is dominating the strategy is transfer. As been discussed earlier, the subtitler managed to uh, translate most of the terms accurately as they share equivalent words in the DL culture. However, some of them are also less equivalent due to like uh, cultural limitations. Hence why trans, uh, translating cultural terms is really difficult or like challenging because several things must be considered. So it requires extra care and also extensive knowledge of both the SL and also the TL culture and also the language. That's why selecti selecting a reasonable 
or like the appropriate strategy can also help uh, to produce acceptable translation in the DL culture. Okay, so here are some of the bibliography that I use. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Miss Aurelia, for the presentation. And next, we will have 10 minutes for question and answer. Session. The first question will be delivered by the judges. So, judges, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Wikan, for your presentation. Okay, it's very interesting, yeah, that you discuss uh, the subpartering strategy in Kisahan Jawa Marathi. And the subject of your uh, research is in the cultural grounds. And also here, I want to give comments to your um, objective. The objective of your research is to analyze the types of subtitling strategy. But after I read the whole paper of yours, uh, it turns out that uh, you also explain some types of cultural, cultural terms in uh, Kisah Tanya Jawa Merapi. So, if I may suggest, uh, you can revise the objective of your research here. Yeah? So, it is not only analyze the types of subtitling strategy, but also uh, explain the types of cultural terms. And then the second is, uh, I see that you use classification of cultural terms from many experts, yeah? like Newmark, New Tomalin, Spindula and etc. So uh, please uh, clarify. I want you to clarify whether they are mixed. You mix their uh, classification, or they work together to create this classification. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'd like to clarify. Uh, I mean, like the three of them work together, or what? I mean, uh, you use uh, many classification of mm -hmm. other terms. Yeah. from many experts. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you mix their classification or they work together to create this classification and you use all of them? Oh, all right, all right. Okay, can, can I answer it now? Yes. Okay, okay. First of all, thank you so much for the feedback, Meili. I would consider that, okay. Uh, so I actually mix all of them. So first of all, I actually first uh, firstly use the classification guidelines by Tomalin and Stampolsky because uh, in this uh, KTG series, it discusses about mis mystical things, right? Uh, and Tomalin and Stampolsky provide uh, classification, for, ex uh, for example, like uh, habit and then beliefs, customs, and also, oh, what is it? Oh, they provide uh, like beliefs and also custom that is very useful in this uh, data because the data consists of lots of uh, terms that is uh, considered as beliefs. So I actually first used that. But then after I uh, calculate all the data, it, it uh, the data kind of like uh, not really, not really enough, uh, not really, uh, you know, big enough to, to make into a paper. So that's why I chose another uh, classification guidelines by uh, Cerbetas and Firoskohi and also Newmark. Okay. So they all kind of like create uh, to be a uh, classification together. Okay. So, and then um, for your format, it is create. Okay. okay. And I want to move to your analysis in table four, data number four. Here, the source text is Perameru Merapi dan Alap-Alap Merbabu. And then it is translated into Merapi Climbing Club and Merbabu Climbing Club. So if you were the translator or if you were the subtitler, how would you translate this cultural term? Because in my opinion, uh, this is a organization name in Indonesia, right? So how would you translate if you were the subtitler? Okay, such an interesting question. Okay, so I guess I would still uh, manage to, uh, you know, uh, I would use uh, the strategy of imitation. I would still left it as it is because it's like the name of the uh, 
the name of the as you as you said before the name of the organization in Indonesia right but then uh, I kind of like maybe using the expansion by adding supplementary uh, supplementary information that it is actually a hiking or like mountain related organization here in Indonesia Oh, so is it possible to just leave the translation as it is like Barameru Merapi as still and Alapak Merbabu as still? Yep, yep, you can do it. Okay, so later on, and the staff member must put some supplementary explanation about what is Barameru Merapi and what is Alapak Merbabu. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, I think that's all for me, from me, sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, May Lee. Yeah. Okay, thank you, May, for your question. Okay, for the next judges, please. Okay, hi, we can. <coughs> okay, hello. Wonderful presentation from you, uh, and there are a lot that Mel already told you. And so I just want to ask about uh, what makes you interested in uh, studying that topic because, and uh, what, uh, what I mean is, uh, why you choose your cultural term as your limitation and uh, as I know, in Kisah Tanah Jawa, uh, the basic Javanese language is not only from Middle Javanese or East or maybe or West. And uh, do you think your target audience needs to uh, know how to differ that language? And also, uh, I want to ask about uh, one of your data about, you say that Astaghfirullah, uh, and I think uh, is it considered as uh, cultural terms or not? I just want to ask that. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Such an interesting question. Okay, first of all, I'll, uh, I'll answer it by one, one by one. Okay, so what made me interested in uh, translating these uh, cultural terms? It is because that, as I mentioned before in my presentation, that Indonesia is kind of like a uh, bridge of cultural and also languages. That's why I kind of like wanted to uh, use this one as the uh, data, as the uh, object to my data because uh, it is so interesting that there is also people that translates cultural terms. And besides this series discussing like mystical things that is still mostly believed in Indonesia. So like I wanted to know uh, what kind of strategy that is commonly used by the subtitler to translate those uh, kind of like this cultural or or this uh, mystical culture because it is not easy for them to translate them. That that's what uh, my that's my reason. And then for uh, the second question, uh, do they have to like differ to know the type of the language? I guess they they don't really have to know the type of. Uh, you mean it's the dialect, right? So they don't really have to know the dialect that is being used, used in KTG because the translation is in English. So then they do not really have to pay attention to the dialect, uh, Japanese dialect that is used in the dialogue. And then for the last part, it is, yes, Astaghfirullah is considered as the cultural terms because it is uh, considered as the religious terms. Uh, is that all answering your question? Um, I want to ask about, uh, uh, is it true that Astarullah is commonly used in our daily life, but is it count as uh, cultural terms? Oh, it is actually cultural term because it is religion, religion related terms. So as uh, lots of Indonesian people here are Muslim, so many of them still uses this guy. Uh, it relates to... Uh, kind of like religion, right? So it is considered as the religion term. Okay, then. Thank you. I think that's <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Is it clear, Asvendino? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you, judges, for delivering your question. Next, the q and from the audience. The audience, please, if you have any question, raise your hands or uh unmute your voice oh, okay nadia nadia you can unmute your voice 
Oh, okay, so uh, good job, Vikan, for your uh, research. Uh, I want to ask uh, about one of your data in your paper, because you uh, discuss about cultural terms, and I found you put buku-buku uh, loa, which which is translated, if I'm not mistaken, it's a free market of books, right? Um, as far as I know, a free market is a uh, free market is available everywhere. So, and buku buku loa, uh, I think free market also sell uh, old books. Uh, so my question is that uh, what makes this free market different from any other free market in the world? And I mean the the term itself, what makes it different? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much for pointing that out. I guess I made a mistake in <laughs> uh, in conducting my paper. So after I read it out again, then I was like also confused in myself, like why did I put this buku buku loa into this kind of data? So I am <laughs> agree with you actually. So I uh, that's like a, a feedback for me to actually reduce uh, to actually eliminate this data into my. Uh, data. <laughs> Thank you very much for pointing that out. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because uh, I, I also confused when I read that too. Uh, so since uh, I want to ask again, uh, so from your research itself, uh, do you think that the subtitle uh, misleading or misinformed about the series because uh, the the result of the translation is like some parts are not uh, translated well to the target language. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I guess even though uh, the subtitle are kind of like not really uh, translating the uh, the ST into the equivalent word in the TT, it does not really misleading the series because I can still understand why the subtitlers chose these this kind of uh, uh, translate uh, this kind of word choice because uh, there is also limitation in uh, screen duration and also uh, visual duration. That's why uh, those subtitles the subtitler chose those kind of uh, word, but it is not misleading the series because the translator, uh, the the word uh, the word choice by the subtitler is kind of like makes sense for the target audience for me, so it is not misleading the series. Okay, so uh, it's uh, it's good, but not really that good, right? Mm -mm, yes, right. Probably it's seven out of ten or eight out of ten, right? Uh, probably yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that's all. Just okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for Nadia. Is there any question from audience? Please share. Yes. Please raise your hands. Okay, Nanda, you can unmute. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, uh. That's a that's a very interesting question because uh, you were talking about Japanese uh, Japanese culture especially and yeah that's really really interesting uh, for me as a Japanese uh, yeah I can say I'm some, some somewhat proud about that your analysis but well, let's get uh, let's jump to the question uh, okay I think my question is uh, a bit related to Nino the judge the judges. Uh, when we're talking about honorifics, especially the honorifics in Japanese, you know, we have uh, three different levels, right? And then in English, we don't, uh, they, they, they don't have that one. But is it really possible if we outsmart that in translation, if we change the honorific, for example, like in English, we have three, I'm sorry, in Japanese, we have three different levels and in English, they don't have one. But how if we outsmart that, like we replace them with the old English or, we can let's say uh switch them or displace them with the politeness of English. Like you know, sometimes in English we have to use polite and imply in any politeness terms like that. Well, what what do you think about that? 
Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much for the uh, question. Okay, so for me, yes, of course, I agree with you that we should uh, all consider the uh, honorifics in Japanese because there's uh, the apa, tingkatan in Japanese to address the, what is it? Bentar, bentar, bentar. I am searching on the data. I guess mm, okay. I already deleted the data. Okay, so of course in the uh, in the KTG there is also honorifics because uh, when old people is talking to old another old people they use uh, not ngoko but kromo right but mm. in the but when I uh, saw the subtitler uh, subtitling subtitle uh, it kind of like removing the removing the uh, removing the word. So just they just erase the word of uh, the honorific words. So they become more kind of like casual in English. Okay. okay. And if you were the translator, what would you do? Would you would you use that method or would you use another method? Uh, I kind of like maybe wanted to use another method, but then if I uh, consider the time duration, if making if the subtitle that I made is kind of like uh, longer and need more time to be read, then I kind of like wanted to read, uh, to uh, cut this, cut it into, to make it more acceptable in the uh, time duration. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, well, I think, uh, yeah, thank you. That's just uh, my curiosity <laughs> because, yeah, the, the, you know the English they don't have the that kind of honorific so yeah, sometimes I get, yeah, I get confused right. like if if this were in Japanese like this that how we should how I should we translate that into the English like right, maybe right. Should, should we take the, the old English the polite and polite English or <laughs> what kind of better to, uh, should we do like that but thank you yeah it's just, just my curiosity cheers okay 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 thank you thank you okay thank you Nanda is there any question again for Miss Aurelia Is there any question, guys? Okay, I think there is no question for Miss Aurelia. So thank you, Miss Aurelia, for your presentation and answers. Okay, for the second speaker, I will welcome I will welcome Miss Eugenia Sekar Anindianari from Universitas Dar Universitas Sanata Dharma. Uh, her personal background is she is an English literature student. And then she has a lot of work history. She, she worked in content writer intern and then freelance English tutor, English, English translator intern, part-time English tutor, English translator. And Mr. Carr has a lot of achievement in in her work history. Okay, guys, with uh, her presentation entitled The Indonesian Translation of Agoda and Booking.com Website Study of Localization and Strategies and Readability. Okay, Miss Eugenia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Yenima. Is my voice good? Yes, that's yeah. okay. Okay, then, so I will share my screen. Okay. Mm. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, as Yenima has introduced before, my name is Eugenia Sakar Anjanari, and today in the eighth seminar on translation, I would like to present my research entitled The Indonesian Translation of Akuda and Booking.com website, a study of localization strategies and capability. And in my presentation this evening, I would like to divide it into five parts. The first one is the background of the study. 
And then the second one is the theories explained, where I will present or explain the theories that I use for my research, and then followed by the methodology that I used for my research, and then the data analysis or my findings. And the last is conclusion remarks. So let's just jump right in into the first section of my presentation today, which is the background of the study. Okay, so globalization and the new industrial era, which is the period that we are currently living in, has effect on many aspects. One of them is the use of various language and digital media. So one of the digital media that is developing is a website or websites, a collection of web pages and related content that is identified by a common domain name and published on at least one web server. In relation to the language and website development, people who speak different languages often visit the same website or they became the users of a certain website. While not everyone speaks the same language, a website with a multitude of available language can help to maintain its continuity. What I mean by this is that because a lot of people or a lot of users of a website did not come from the same country, a website, a website that provides different language choices will be able to maintain its continuity more than the website that doesn't provide uh, many languages or only available in one or two languages. So this will also help in increasing the inclusivity of the website and to reach more audience. And in addition to the background that I said before, only a few studies on website localization have been carried out until this day. So uh, as a result, this research aims to offer more discussion on this particular subject or on the or on the issue of website localization. Okay, so these are my research objects. I use two objects. The first one is Agoda. Agoda is an online travel agency and a search engine for hotels, vacation rentals, and flights. It was founded in 2008 as an e-commerce startup in Singapore and was later acquired by Booking Holdings Incorporated in 2007. Agoda are available in 38 languages. The second object is Booking.com. Booking.com is also a travel agency based in Amsterdam. It is ranked second globally in travel and tourism websites specified in accommodations and hotels according to SimilarWeb.com. So uh, from all of the backgrounds of the study that I have explained and from the research object, I formulate two problem formulation. The first one is, what are the localization strategies applied in the Indonesian translation of Agoda and Google.com websites? And the second one is, how are the translated components readable to the users? And before I continue, I would like to ask, uh, is my voice heard despite the sound of the mosque? Yes. Okay, so if it is heard, I would like to continue. But if it doesn't, just please tell me and maybe I can stop for a little bit too so that the mosque voice will be disappear after a while. Okay. So... Uh, follow uh, the second one is the theories of life or the theories that I use in my research. And I would like also to explain about localization. So localization is a process of adapting a product to a new local. This is a definition brought up by Sandrini on his journal article in 2018. It is a process beyond translation that includes transferring and adapting a software or web product for a for a particular local group to ease use. And if you are wondering what is the difference between localization and translation, I hope these examples will help you to uh, get more understanding about it. So this is a simple localization example of website, of website localization. Uh, these are the title tags for Nescafe website in India, Indonesia, 
German and Korea. Uh, they are not literally translated into different language because as you can see here, the title is in India, it is Nescafe Most Love Coffee Brands by Nestle. In Indonesia, it is Situs Resmi Kopi Nescafe Indonesia. And in German, because I cannot read what is it, I translate it into solo book, uh, I translated via Google Translate in solo book coffee, instant coffee, and cappuccino. And in the Korean one, it is all start. It all starts with a Nescafe. So, uh, localization doesn't always uh, translate a specific text into other language, but it adapts that specific text so that it can, uh, so that it can follow a new local. And then they are not, yes, but they are not literally translated into different language, but they maintain a specific characteristic for each country. And this is the, another example, the landing page of Nescafe. Here is the landing page for the Indian version. And this is the Indonesian version. And this is the German version. And you can see here that the font size is different between the Indian and the Indonesian and the German. And the German version has a button here that the Indonesian version doesn't have. So that's why it is called a localization because it doesn't follow the exact same rules, but it applies to a different uh, local or different culture. And lastly, this is the Korean version. And although it's got the same title as the Indian version, it all starts with Nescafe. The message contained in this uh, passage is different. Okay, so I will also explain about the website components. I use the theory by Pianini in her journal of article written in 2007. Uh, according to Pierini, a website is divided into two parts. The first one is verbal components, which are the textual aspect in a website. The title bar, keywords and descriptors, menu items, and hyperlinks. And then the second one is the nonverbal components, which are images, sound, and audiovisual files. This also includes other visual aspects such as colors and why colors are uh, included in the nonverbal components. Uh, because, as you know, some colors are agreeable to a certain culture, but it is also unacceptable in others. So you can see the uh, what is the key example of the color white in Chinese, if I'm not mistaken, is meant for grief, while in another is meant for like holy and purity. So they convey a different meaning, right? That's why we sh a localizer should be careful in adapting a website or another product which has these sensitive colors. Okay, so this is the website localization strategies that I apply for my research. The first one is the verbal components are translated without adaptation and the non-verbal are unmodified. And then the second one is only a small parts of the SD or the source text that are modified. And then the verbal component is completely rewritten without modifying the non-verbal one. And lastly, both components are modified. Okay, so this is the methodology. And I apply a qualitative research. So the first step that I do is sampling, which is choosing a web page from the whole website. And I choose landing page because it is a place that a potential site visitor can become a customer because it offers service like sales information, deals, or important contacts. And then there's the data collection. I collect and code the data. And finally, I analyze it through a library research in a through dictionary. So these are the data analysis. And I would like to highlight a few things. The first one is I only present the first problem formulation, which is the localization strategy. And I conduct the localization strategy on the step on the stage of translation. And all the data presented here were taken on March 2021. And so if you take a look at the websites now, there might be some differences because they are the websites are updated regularly. So the first one, translated without adaptation, the first strategy. Here you can see in the source text that it is written solo traveler. Meanwhile, in the target text, it is written wisatawan solo. There is no further adaptation in transferring the SD into the PC. That's why it is categorized as a translated without adaptation. 
uh, same like the source text from booking.com. The source text is airport taxi, meanwhile, the target text is taxi bandara. So this is also translated without quotation. Moving on to the second strategy, which is partially modified. Here in the source text, you can see that the phrase family travelers, it is actually can be translated into wisatawan keluarga in Indonesia. However, the word wisatawan is omitted, which makes a change in some part of the TV, because the target text only written keluarga. So therefore, there are some aspects in the verbal components that is modified. And here in booking.com, you can see that the source text is attractions and the target text is ataksi wisata. So this adds a new word in the target text. Presumably, this is done in order to match the website's context of travel and tourism. And moving on to the third strategy, the completely rewritten one. Here you can see in the source text from Agoda, overheard from travelers. Meanwhile, it is translated into apa kata mereka. This is completely rewritten because there are no meanings of overheard or travelers that is conveyed in the target text. And then in the source text of booking.com, you can see here this is the place of interest, which is translated into landmark, which are both in English and the landmark is not yet included in uh, Indonesian Comprehensive Dictionary or KBBE, but they both convey a similar meaning. And lastly, both components are modified. Here you can see this is the source text, travel talk, and this is the verbal components that comes with it. Uh, this is a section for the travel community in booking.com that, uh, that enables their users to discuss a certain uh, places or a certain destination or a certain way to get into a place. But this is only available in the English version of the website. This means that both the purple, this one, the travel talk, and the non-purple, the picture, are modified in the PP because they are omitted. So this is the English version of the website. Uh, if you visit it now, it will look like this, explore Indonesia section, connect, uh, followed by the connect with other travelers. This is the English version, but in the Indonesian version, you can see that the connect with other travelers is unavailable here. So yeah, it is omitted. We then may wonder why is it unavailable. So according to Pim in his journal article in 2010, a localization is a process to adapt features to suit the local audiences. It is assumed that the travel community section is only available in the English version of the website because it targeted users from English speaking countries, not because Indonesia is not an English speaking country. That's why the travel talk section is not available. Moving on to the conclusion one. Uh, so there are four localization strategies used in Indonesian translation of Agoda and Booking.com. However, the last strategy, which is to modify both of the verbal and non-verbal components, is only applied to Booking.com, as I mentioned before, the travel talk section, and it creates a local specific content on the website. And then localization is a process beyond translation. It includes transferring and adapting a software or web product for a particular local group to ease their usage. And then to do this process, a localizer should be able to not only understand the target language, but also understand the local culture. Okay, and that's all from my presentation today. Thank you. And yes, I would like to give it back to the moderator. Okay, thank you, Miss Eugenia, for the presentation. Now we will have 10 minutes for question and answer sessions. For the first question, as always, delivered by the judges. So, judges, please, the floor is yours. So, thank you, Sakar, for your presentation. Uh, first, I will give comment to, your, to the title of your research. Here, the title is the Indonesian translation of Akuda and Pooping.com website, a study of localization strategies and readability. Uh, but in your analysis and in your uh, presentation, uh, there is no readability analysis. So please uh, clarify what do you mean by readability here? 
because I didn't find any credibility result of Indonesian translation uh, between these two websites. Okay, so thank you, Miliana, for the input. And like, as I said before in my presentation, I highlighted it because this is a seminar paper and Therefore, I only analyze the localization set keys and I keep the readability for my complete thesis. So this is like only the half of my thesis presentation. And because I cannot just omit the title of my full thesis, that's why I keep the readability there. But I, yeah, like I did now, I clarified during my presentation. Oh, okay. Thank you, Sakar. Yeah. Okay. And then huh, for the format of your paper, here I found uh, your introduction is not uh, under the uh, abstract, yeah. Am I right? Okay, so uh, later on you can revise uh, your paper on the first page. There's supposed to be an introduction under um, the, the abstract and keywords. And then, um, what else? Okay, it is interesting that you choose to uh, analyze website localization. And are you a user of good uh, websites? Uh, yes, apparently sometimes I use it, but yes, I also like interested in it. So I am both the users and the inter and the yes, interested person. <laughs> oh, okay, so of course, if in website localization, there are still uh, like for example, in the user inter uh, interface, uh, how open the user interface? Uh, do uh, do localization affect the user interface provided uh, in the website? Uh, yes, uh, the user in the localization is also uh, affect the user interface because if you open the booking.com website in the Arabic version, in the Arabic language, you can see that the scroll bar, the scroll bar is usually on the right side of the of our laptop, right on our screen. But in the Arabic version, you can see that the scroll bar is on the left side because uh, Arabic writing started from right to left. Therefore, it is the scroll bar is put it on the left side, unlike the other language. Right? So, uh, which one is the most uh, local friendly, in your opinion? I think they, uh, they are almost the same, right? Yes. Like in the landing page, they have like uh, the same, uh, or in the top right, we can find, um, wait, let me open <laughs> the website. <laughs> Uh, here we can uh, daftarkan properti anda in the top right and also register and login in booking.com and also in Abuja. Uh, what, what do you think? Okay, so this is only like a hypothesis or uh, it's yeah, half subjective opinion of mine. And I think this, uh, that the booking.com is more is localized because I found it before in my research that it has a content, a local specific content. So like the travel box section that is unavailable in the Indonesian version of the website. And I think that booking.com does that to does it increase its localization level in, according to me. Uh, but my choice for the, which one is the most, more localized. And for the, uh, and for the translation, the web translation uh, does uh, do they still consistent in their translation after it is being uh, localized? Uh, consistent is seen from the localization strategies. Yes, they are both consistent in what is it using the mostly using the first localization strategy or adapting it without the uh, translating it without any adaptation. So like literal translation, they are consistent with that study. Okay, thank you, Sakar, for your answer. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, okay. thank you May. Okay, for the next judges, please, Alpendino. Sakar. <coughs> mm. 
um, yeah. just stay to the question. I I, I guess <laughs> there's a lot of comment that may has told to you. So uh, the first thing is uh, this uh, localization strategies. I'm really know about that. And is this kind of strategy only applied to a website kind of thing or it can apply to other sources? Okay. So uh, when I did the research for the chapter two, there are uh, the, uh, other media that can be localized. Uh, I saw that there are video games and then, uh, yes, mostly video games and ads. Yes, like that, but not all, all of them use the localization strategies offered by Jamie. Uh, some of them still use translation strategies, but because I want to make my research uh, deeper into localization, that's why I use the elements here. Uh, is this localization strategy is only applied by uh, a tools or or it is made by someone who translated? Oh, so uh, like the localization process? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, as I said before, the localization process is deeper than just translating the, the content. It is also related to the uh, uh, website, like the front end and back end developer, things like that, and on the server. And then more on the contents is like the people that understand the culture of the target local, things like that. So I guess localization is a combination between the work of people or persons, experts, and tools like computers, internet, and so on. Okay, and um, uh, you, uh, you mentioned that there's a few studies that have been uh, conducted in these localization strategies, right? And do you find any of the related studies that you use and is it helping you to analyze your research? Yes, it helps me because uh, I, I see that localization can not, uh, can not only be analyzed with just one, one theory only, like the localization theory only, but it can also use the analyze but it can also be analyzed use the translation strategies so it helps me that localization and translation is basically a related topic like that okay thank you scar thank you no okay thank you judges for delivering your question uh, next before we next the uh, the question for audience, I will inform you guys on 4 October, Sakar will share about UX writing. You are, you are all welcome to join with Sakar. Uh, maybe you, you want to join, you can ask Sakar the, the link. Okay, Sakar? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Next, the Q and A from the audience. The audience, please, if you have any question, unmute your voice or raise your hand. Oh, okay, Brigitta Villa. Okay, <clears throat> hi Sakar. Hi. Um, congratulations for delivering a such interesting paper. And uh, I want to ask you about your conclusion, you are mentioning about localization. Localizing a website is related to how much the site values uh, inclusivity and cultural diversity. So they could attract more attention and new users uh, worldwide. So do you think how often websites out there should update their pages? Like how many times they should localize again in the future because as we know our uh, language updates each day right so every day we gain a new what is it slang word or maybe a new culture terms that is more local than before so do you think how many times a website or maybe 
application should localize again their page. Thank you. Okay, this is a thank you, Bunita. Uh, this is a very interesting question, and you give me new insights whether I haven't looked on before. So, uh, uh, honestly, I haven't done much research on how much a website should be updated in order to uh, maintain its localization. But uh, as what I see from my research when I look on the Agoda and the uh, the thing that needs to be updated is not the whole site. So you can just keep the title and then you can keep the title part, the descriptors, you can keep the, what is it? The footers like that, but the thing that should be updated and maintain to maintain the localization maybe is like the deals, like the discounts, and then the testimonies that people make according to the website, like that. Uh, so, in my opinion, because I haven't research, uh, done more research on this, in my opinion, maybe it's like uh, monthly uh, for six months because that is when uh, the websites can gain more users, more visitors, and maybe more people that use it to uh, help them in their life, use the websites for their services. But the update doesn't, all, doesn't always apply to all of the aspects in the website. It's like I said before, only like the deals, the discounts, and so on. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, it is actually so. You think that maybe for more regular, what is it, content like a review, uh, suggestion, and then deals, they can do it more monthly, maybe in six months or a year. But for a major update, such as maybe a new, not content, but new part, I guess, like uh, what you mentioned before about the talkative or connect with another travelers that is not available in Indonesia version, they could update it in the future, but it is very major, right? Uh, they don't do it like every month. Is that you are suggesting? Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Brigitta. Okay, is there any question again? again? Oh, wow, we got two questions. Okay, maybe Ray first. Yeah, you can unmute your voice. All right, thank you for the opportunity. I would like uh, to express that it was an interesting uh, topic to discuss. However, I would like to ask you uh, two questions. It's basically uh, more like a real life application of as the end user of the website. Uh, the first one is uh, what is the relationship between uh, localization strategies and readability, uh, as uh, you would like to explain. And second, um, how would you react or explain on the readability if tra the uh, translation from English to another region, say uh, another language, uh, is deemed to be slightly misleading or inaccurate? Uh, I think that's all the question, uh, thank you. Uh, should I answer first or uh, how? Yes, you can answer first. Okay, okay thank you. Um, okay, so the first question, what is the relation between localization quality and readability, right? Okay, so uh, at first, actually, uh, the, I do not analyze the, the readability. I actually wanted to analyze the usability of the site. So it, talk, it talks about the user's journey, the, the flow of uh, the designs of the website, and so on. But it turns out that it doesn't really it doesn't really connect with the translation studies. That's why I choose to use readability for my second problem formulation. So what is the relation between localization policy and readability? When a website is localized, uh, what is it? Localized well, well localized, uh, the people that use it, the certain local that use it, will understand it more. Um, 
for example, if you use a English speaking slang in a website that is uh, aimed for Indonesian people, but you keep you literally translated the slang. What is it? For example, yeah, just imagine that there's a slang that is only an English speaker that understands, and then you literally translate it in, into Indonesian. Will you? Will the feel and the look of the slang still feel the same to you as an Indonesian person? Mm, I haven't thought of an example yet, but I think that maybe you can find some specific slang in your in your mind like that. So look, uh, based on it, localization is not only about the localization quality is not only about transferring the what is it, transferring one language into another, but to keep the look and the feel of a certain site of a certain message so that a certain local can feel the same way the source text readers feel like that. So I think that's the connection between the readability and the localization quality. And then the second question, uh, I'm sorry, uh, can you please repeat the second one? Mm. Oh, it's the effect on readability if uh, the translation from English to another language or another region uh, deemed to be slightly misleading or inaccurate. How would I react? How would I react to a certain localization? Is is okay. So, um, maybe, uh, maybe it will affect the user's journey or the user's feeling while they use that product. So, if it is misleading, of course, it will be. Uh, what is it? It will be disagreeable to the users. It will cause like riots or things like that if in a large scale, right? But sometimes maybe it will only cause like confusion and then um protest maybe like to the uh customer service of the website, for example, like why did you put this contents or why did you put this certain words, this certain picture when it is not. Uh, agreeable to my culture, to my local traditions, like that. Um, yeah, maybe that's how will I react, and I hope that answers your question, Ray. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Okay, we move to Nanda's question. Nanda, you can unmute. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I have two questions, and I must admit that your presentation is fascinating uh, because it's related to technology and uh, yeah it's just uh, really good to me uh, but before i jump to my first question uh, i'd like to clarify or maybe i should uh, yes uh, for clarification because when you were explaining about the website localization uh, i had no time for it because you moved it too fast so i didn't know what it was so is uh it does website localization deal with layout Okay, so do you mean the user interface or the design of a website? Yeah, yeah the website localization, like the, you mentioned uh, in the presentation. Does it deal with the layout? Yes, it deals with the layout. Wait, wait. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So if it deals with the layout, so how does it differ with the UE design? And the second question, uh, you mentioned that the translation, the, the location is more than or is beyond the common translation because the translation based on the locals, it means based on the product of the locals and the local means people, people mean users. And what it, what it deals with the users because you know, on 4th of October, you're the boss, right? Because you're going to present that. And I know that you're the boss, so I think you know a lot than me about the UX writing. So, well, this is all in my opinion that I think, yes, as far as I know, the UX writing, uh, it, it, it deals with the text. So we're like uh, arranging the text based on, on the users to, 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 to appeal the readers. So 
is this kind of the same thing uh, that localization is actually based on the UX writing or is it actually uh, specified on different parts of the UX writing? Thank you. Okay, thank you Nanda for the question. Um, okay. Mm. Yes, uh, if for regarding your first question, uh, what is the difference between localization and UI design? Because localization also applies in the layout of the site. Okay, so uh, as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned, the localization is on the way you deliver that certain product or certain site or a certain message into a certain person uh, with a certain culture. Like that. So it is about the message. It is about the message and about the culture. Whether uh, while well, UI design is about how a screen, how a layout of the screen satisfy you while you are using it. Like whether the journey of you while using a site or an application is comfortable or is it like uh difficult for you to uh retract your journey from the, from the time you install the app until the time that you close the app whether something is making you questioning uh, what did i do before how how would i should what, where should i go now how would i supposed to react now in this type in this type of page in this type of screen like that so ui design is about the design while localization is about the message that you transfer to the certain culture or certain local and then the second question is uh, how uh, what how is localization related to UX writing? Okay, so uh, UX writing is basically you put the you put a certain text, you design the text in order to ease people's journey while using an app or a website like that. Uh, localization uh, if it is made into an order, localization is conducted after the UX is written. So you make the flow of the users first, and then when you need to put this product into another country or another culture, you do the localization. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Okay, the second one, I think I understand that very well. But well, the first one, uh, I I actually get the difference between the website localization and UI design. But how does it differ again between web localization and product designer? Okay. Um. Yeah, actually, I have also. I'm sorry because I haven't done a lot of research on that. But uh, from what I read that. During the localized localization process, it also uh, includes a product manager or the person that is responsible for the certain product like that. So, uh, presumably, during the during a localization process, the localizer should confirm to the product manager, uh, "Is this what you mean when you write this originally? And am I translating this message correctly into a certain local like that?" Like so like confirming whether the message is the same or not. If not, then maybe the product manager and the localizer can discuss more and in how they can transfer this certain message into different culture like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I get it now. I get it now. Okay. That's <laughs> that's interesting because those three, the website location, UI design and product, they, they all look the same to me. So I can't find any difference. And I was like, what's the difference between them? And it's what is this job? Yeah, but yeah, thank you for uh, enlightening me up. That's uh, really interesting. Yeah. Thank you for your questions too. Okay, thank you, Nanda. Is there any question again for Mr. Khan? Oh, okay, Nadia. You can unmute your voice. Uh, okay, so uh, good job for your research, Sakar. Uh, I would like to ask, since uh, I read in, I think in the two layers of your uh, data that uh, the target text is still in English. Uh, from place 
of interest, if I'm not mistaken, to landmark. That's still in English, right? So if you were uh, one of the team that translate uh, the website, uh, what will you do as the translator to translate it uh, correctly and also understandable to the, uh, what is it, the visitors of the website? Thank you, Nadia, for the questions. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Okay, so the places of interest in the tab, if you open the website, if you see the tab places of interest, it will, the contents is the places that is mostly visited by people. And then the, if I'm not mistaken, the number of the search, I think, yeah, like that. So the pla so the places of interest consist places like Disneyland, Yorobudur, what else? Pantai Kuta, things like that. And if I were the localizer that is responsible for translating places of interest into Indonesia, maybe I will translate it into uh, destinasi unggulan because you, you know that uh, when that a certain place attracts many interests, uh, it is also as unggulan, right? Like a lot of people choose to go there, so yeah. It's like the first choice uh, of the travelers like that. Thank you. Oh, so uh, it can be said that uh, the localized version, I mean, the Indonesian version of the website, it sounds uh, quite misleading, right? Uh, so if, uh, for example, uh, you enc encounter this kind of uh, situation again, and the term somehow uh, it cannot be translated, and you cannot meaning that you cannot find the exact equivalent of uh, the into I mean the exact equivalent. Uh, what will you do then? Uh, will you uh, what is it? Uh, create uh, like uh, recreate another kind of uh, term like in overheard from tourists or travelers and apa kata mereka like that? Okay, yeah, maybe that can also be done to uh, maintain the same meaning, but uh, through a different kind of, what is it, a different kind of words or a different kind of meaning. Yeah, so, uh, yes, it can still be done if you want to completely rewrite it into a when it is not if it is did not have the same meaning as the source text but convey the same message. Yes, it can still be done like that. So that's why I in the first in your first question, that's why I translated into the as in Duran because it conveys the same meaning. Uh, does it answer your question? Mm, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Nadia. Is there any question again for Ms. Sakari, guys? Okay. I think there is no question. Okay. There is no question for Ms. Sakari. Okay. If there is no question for Ms. Sakari, again, I would say thank you for Ms. Sakari for, your, for delivering your presentation and your answers. And guys, don't forget on... For, for October to join in UX writing Zoom meeting with Miss Sakan. Okay. I remind for judge to submit your peer evaluation and the others may leave. Okay. I think this is the end for our conference today. Thank you for Mr. Harris, the speakers and the participants for joining this conference. May I... Next, I give this floor to Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you guys. It was uh, such a lively discussion, yeah, something that I really expect the class of seminar will go on like this. Also in next, in the weeks to come and also in um, Friday and also Wednesday classes will at least uh, will be, will 
proceed like what we are doing now. So this this class will be the benchmark for um, discussions of research seminar. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah. I appreciate very much yeah, the judges and the audience who ask, <clears throat> and not just asking, but there are some uh, dialogues and also discussion. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think we have enough for today. And I'll see you next week with um, May. Oh, yeah, May and Nino, yeah, with moderator Chris Ivan and judges Yemima and Lily. Okay, thank you guys. See you next Monday. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.